uh, the next talk is uh, by Dr. Kumu uh, Rajasekharan. She is a, a pediatrician and senior consultant at the Adolescent Medicine Service at KK Women's and Children's Hospital. She's also a visiting consultant at the Eating Disorder Unit SGH and an adjunct assistant professor at Duke NUS and the deputy chair of the CEC at KK. So um, please join me in welcoming her to speak on decision-making in adolescence capacity and competence. So I'm gonna talk about a group of individuals that are not as cute as and cuddly as children and often thought of as rather prickly, okay? But this is what I do for a living, really. Okay, and um, I will start with talking about context first. I always like to start setting context and definitions. Okay, so WHO definitions of what an adolescent is, is usually those in the second decade of life. Generally begins with biological changes of puberty and ends with the adoption of adult social roles and responsibilities. So to set it sort of in a global context, today's generation of young people, which are termed 10 to 24 years of age by WHO, um, is the largest in history. Over one quarter of the world's population is now between the ages of 10 and 24, and close to 90% of young people live in low or middle income countries. So we've always talked about context, right? So I just want you to set that in your con the context of a teen in your country may be very different from the context of the teen in my country. The challenges of a teen in your country is very different from the challenges of the teen in my country, okay? But an estimated 70% of premature adult deaths are due to behaviors that begin in adolescence. So you need to kind of bring that into context. I have a vested interest in them because they're gonna look after me when I become 80, right? So I'm clear about this. So we talk a lot about autonomy, right? So to bring the context of autonomy, I would just like to define it a little bit, right? It's a capacity to think, decide, and act on one's own free initiative. And every adult has the capacity and competence to decide whether to consent to or refuse proposed medical intervention unless it is shown that they cannot understand information presented in a clear way. So that looks at individuals with mental capacity or without mental capacity, right? And then we also talked a little bit about vulnerability, who are the vulnerable. So when you, I'm a pediatrician, adolescent physician, so I deal with minors, and minors themselves are considered vulnerable because the vulnerable are those who are absolutely or relatively incapable of protecting their own interests. Uh, they may have insufficient power, intelligence, education, resources, strength, or other needed attributes to protect their own interests. So just gives you an idea that it is quite related, okay? So those who are vulnerable, those who have not acquired autonomy, and that's the population uh, pediatricians deal with because we're, they're minors. Uh, and there are others who are vulnerable as well, and Titus summarized it yesterday, those who feel they cannot assert their autonomy, the disabled, the marginalized, the stigmatized, the disempowered, those that lack resources, lack institutional support. So that is uh, the context we're dealing with. But you've got to think about it. Children do have rights, don't they? So the UN Convention on the Rights of a Child World leaders made a historic commitment to the world's children by adopting this, an international agreement on childhood. It's the most rapidly and widely ratified international human rights treaty in history. It is now, I think, ratified in almost all countries except one. I'll leave you to think about which one. I'll answer you maybe later. Every human being below the age of 18 years, unless under the law applicable to the child, or the majority, or age of majority is attained earlier. So it, it depends on, the, again, the local context. The convention changed the way children are viewed and treated. They are human beings with a distinct set of rights instead of passive objects of care and charity. And this unprecedented acceptance shows a wide 
worldwide global commitment to advancing children's rights. Okay, so the right is to be protected against all forms of abuse and violence. And individually, there's many more of this. So what about locally? Right? So the CYPA, or the Children and Young Persons Act, was enacted in 1949 in Singapore to provide for the welfare, care, and protection of children and young persons, as well as the treatment and rehabilitation of children and young persons who are beyond parental control or who have committed an offense. Okay? So this is our local context. And this is the law that protects our children. And Again, I like to keep things very simple and keeps them safe. So, local context, Children and Young Persons Act in Singapore covers children up to the age of 14 and young persons from the age of 14 to 18. Uh, it was, I th the, the age went from 16 to 18 about two years ago here locally. Uh, juveniles are defined as the age of seven up to 16. Uh, so alcohol, cigarettes, and driving, always these minimum age of competence to do certain things, right? So minimum age in Singapore to purchase is 18. Cigarettes is 21 actually now. Um, driving is 18. And education in Singapore is compulsory up to the age of 12, which is primary six. And actually MOE is mandated to keep kids in school actually up to the age of 14 as much as they possibly can. And legal, legal minimum age to engage in sexual intercourse is 16 years of age. So if we think about it in the local context, I'm just giving it to you in the local context so that you have some idea. We're gonna do the panel talk later on so you have an idea about that. Ages below 14 will need consent from a person of parental responsibility. Uh, from the law, it may be inferred and applied where, where your threshold is going to be. Gillick competency should be able to be applied between the ages of 14 to 18. Uh, above age 18, actually, the young person can consent to medical treatment because there's no law that says they can't. Okay? And age of majority or age where you can vote is actually age 21. In Singapore, you can, I learned this from Sumi recently, you can actually enter into contract at the age of 18. So in, I don't come here as an ethicist, I come here as a clinician. And because I deal with an age group, this is really the things that I deal with on a kind of day-to-day -day basis about the ethics in adolescent health, right? right? Consent for treatment, consent for things, right? So their capacity and competency. Just because the law says you haven't got that capacity or competency to do so, does that mean you actually don't formally have that? I talked a little bit about confidentiality yesterday. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about best interests and significant harm and them as a vulnerable population and advocating for them. So context a bit. Anybody who has a teenager in their life will know that their brain really works differently from an adult brain. And there is a reason for it. Okay, uh, pictures of the brain in action in teens show that it, when they make decisions and they solve problems, they use a part of their brain that we don't use anymore. And this is because the prefrontal cortex is still developing in teens. And they will rely on the amygdala, the emotional core of your, their brain to make decisions and to solve problems. Uh, and this amygdala is associated with emotions, impulses, aggression, and uh, instinctive behavior. So the 10 foot tall and bulletproof teenager, there is a reason for it. Okay, there's also a reason why people think of teens the same way over centuries. Not much has changed. But Piaget's stages of cognitive development, looking through uh, that timeline, does say that adolescents can actually reason abstractly and think in hypothetical terms. So you got to balance these two things, right? When I look at the adolescent health concerns, the three baskets I, I look at usually are the types of things that uh, are stated above there. So what are the persisting health problems from childhood? 
right? Chronic illness. Um, can they not make decisions for themselves in treatment? And they go from, and as Mayok said, you know, 17 years and 363 days, you cannot make decisions for yourself, but the 364th day, lo and behold, you become an adult, right? There are manifest youth health problems, right? Mental health issues, substance use, accidental injuries. And then, of course, the behaviours and the health behaviours and the risk-seeking behaviours that, that become habits often start at that age group and are risk for later disease, which we are trying in Singapore as a healthier, happier SG, right? The whole thing about social prescribing and social determinants of health. These are the buzzwords that are moving around right now. But do we really understand what that means? So adolescents' rights to make decisions for themselves depend on their ability to do so. In law, it's often defined by a capacity to perform a task in question like we talked about. And some tasks are really defined, like driving a car. I mean, some people would think owning a pet or a dog and giving responsibility to the teen to look after is also a task that a parent gives to their kid, right? Um, age of consent, oftentimes by a lot of us, we look at it as age of majority and equate it to the age of majority. And competence is assumed above this age. And in Singapore law, it is 21. So if you, can, if you ask a surgeon if it's an elective procedure and if the patient is 19 years old, they would much prefer the parent also sign the consent, right? Because in our law, age of majority is 21 years of age. To enter into contract, as I said, 18 years. Consent to procedures, actually 18 years. Um, if you're married or a parent, you're an emancipated minor. And again, Gillick competency, I just repeat, assumed 14 to 18 years of age. So to have the competence to consent to treatment, and this has been repeated so many times, but I think we, we just really need to remind ourselves simply again what that means. You need to possess qualities associated with self-determination, the cognitive ability to understand and communicate, the ability to reason hypothetically and deliberate, to have rationality and a sense of self-identity. And I cannot say that all teens don't have this, because they do, and a lot of them do. The problem, I think, with the, the developing teenage brain, one 14-year-old is very different from another 14-year-old. And that, I think, is what it is. When you're walking and you're talking, there are certain milestones you achieve in a very significant chronological basis, but not with the developing brain. So the criteria for testing competence in, in a young person is to understand simple terms, nature, purpose, and necessity for proposed treatment, understand benefits, risks, alternatives, and effects of non-treatment, believe that the information applies to them, retain information long enough to make a choice, and make a choice free from pressure. Now, having a teen sit through with you to do all of these things, so this is like a, f I suppose you could say a formal way of assessing competence in anyone really, not just the teen, right? Now, it's, but there's no diagnostic test and it's not a tick box. And capacity is questioned in mental health diagnosis, especially when refusal of treatment. So they need to understand and appreciate things. And we need to know whether they understand and appreciate things. And there is really no test for that, is there? And of course, if you are deemed incapable, then there's a right to a legal advisor and a substitute decision maker. And with teens and with minors, I mean, the substitute decision maker is parents. Then we talk about Gillick competency. As a matter of law, the parental right to determine whether or not a minor below the age of 16 will have medical treatment terminates if and when the child achieves sufficient understanding and intelligence to understand fully what is proposed. Now Gillick, I think Mrs. Gillick, I'm not sure if she's still alive right now, she probably doesn't like the fact that her name is associated with this competency test because she brought it up. So the, the main thing about Gaelic competency was actually about contraception. Uh, in this local area, I think in a GP newsletter, they really talked about, and so we can correct me if I'm wrong, but they talked about contraception. Contraception, she had two girls, uh, and they talked about prescribing contraception without parental knowledge. 
she was not happy about it. So she, that's why I brought it up. But I don't think she was quite happy with the outcome of this. Okay, so Gillick competence says that a teen can consent to treatment with sufficient intelligence and understanding. And remember, laws are such, there is no bottom out in terms of the age though. So when does that happen? I mean, we can look at certain evidence and we can say, oh, Piaget says 12, or we can say this, but we, we don't know. But ethically, we as health professionals have a duty to respect the rights of teens and provided that the consequence does not result in harm. And here with minors, best interest principle often trumps a lot of things. But what about parents' role in this, right? What is that nature of relationship? Does parental authority equal to parental autonomy, that I can make decisions, whatever it is, right? I always like to say I, I don't like that term authority or even autonomy. I like to think about it as responsibility. As, your, as a surrogate decision maker for your minor, whatever age that is, you have that responsibility. And the assumption is that parents will take that responsibility and exercise their children's rights in a way that is appropriate. That is not always true. What about physician's duty and responsibility? And what about the adolescent's voice in this whole thing when it comes to the increasing autonomy of the child and young person? Because it is a spectrum, isn't it? And, it, and, and they grow into that adulthood and that decision-making process, right? So parental rights are not absolute. And they do not exist for the benefit of the parent. They exist for the benefit of the child and are justified only in so far as they enable the parent to perform his duties towards the child. Autonomy is a key principle in clinical ethics and often thought of as the fattest pillar in that four pillars, right? And it is underpinning principle in medical law, particularly in the area of informed consent. And in context of decision-making on behalf of children and teens, overriding parental decisions limits that parental responsibility, actually. And you should have good reason if you're going to override that parent's decision. And you also, I think, have to have a good reason if you're going to override the teen's decision as well. So Mel brought this up, and I'll give you a little bit of context of this case in Singapore. I cannot read, I cannot see very well. No? So a man has filed a court application to pave the way for his 16-year-old daughter to get the COVID vaccine after his ex-wife, who shares joint custody of the teen, opposed the jab. So to give a context to this, is the, the man himself is a PR in Singapore. He's already remarried, and the, uh, his ex-wife is a Singaporean as well. So they share joint custody, and they've been divorced for several years. Um, he himself is vaccinated, and the wife strongly opposed to allow the daughter. And actually, the wife's reason for it was saying she, that my daughter has a frivolous reason for getting vaccinated. She wants to go and visit her grandmother in the UK, and at the time, you could not travel without having the COVID vaccine. Um, and so he turned to the court. During this time as well, what happened was, I think while it was during court, she the young person actually did go for her first shot. This was the time there was two shots. This was with the father's, I don't know whether it was implicit knowledge or not, but he, uh, he had signed the consent for her to get that first shot as well. Okay, So the court did rule in favour of the father who wants his 16-year-old vaccinated. Now, there are two dividing views about this, whether it's, uh, did it really truly test Gillick competency here in Singapore. In truth, it's the first time that term Gillick competency actually showed up in a judgment in court, even though it was in family court and wasn't in the apex court. Um, and they actually did have a court-appointed individual actually interview the young person to get her views and to see whether she was competent enough to make that decision, right? Um, I just, my thoughts about this is that I wouldn't say this is true Gillick. I call it Gillicky. So I kind of, 
hedges bets because one must remember the context of this situation because other than the judge, the parents and the kid, you did have the Singapore government saying it is very, very highly encouraged that you get the COVID vaccine. I'm not saying due diligence was not done, but you know, that is the context of the situation. So yesterday, we did talk a little bit about confidentiality. And I am a strongly firm believer in this. The rights to confidentiality exist independently to, com to the competence to consent to treatment. It encourages mutual trust and exceptions are when there's risk of harm. And our jobs as professionals in the healthcare context would be to be safety, that patient. And you have to remind yourself, when you have a young person in the room, the parent is not the patient. The person in front of you is the patient, right? So with a competent young person, um, when we should not be kept, or when can you break confidentiality? And I have, and because I do this on a day-to-day -day basis, this is a statement I, I, I say all the time, and I say it with the parent in the room, okay? And it's really simple and easy, if you, you know, homicide, suicide, abuse. Okay, that's the time when you can break confidentiality. I always check, though, that the team does understand what the the term confidentiality means. And kids as young as nine and 10 can tell you, secret, cannot tell anybody. So they do know, they do understand it, okay? And with an incompetent young person, any situation is where there's significant risk of harm to the adolescent or to others. So safety is one of those things. And I do say to them, look, at the end of the day, my job is to keep you safe, and I will do that. So one of the the reasons I bring up confidentiality is because youth mental health uh, is a, really a big uh, issue, I think, at this particular point in time. Or the poor youth, youth mental health, I think, is a particularly something that's been out there. Okay? Right. So studies show that pediatric mental health disorders affect approximately one in five of all children and adolescents. And serious mental health issues begin early in life, with approximately 50% developing by age of 14 and 75% by age of 24. What about Singapore's local context? So this has been in the news locally for, for a while. So a recent study by NUH Psychiatry and NUS Psychology in collaboration with MOE, it's called the Year Study, one in three youths in Singapore report internalizing mental health symptoms, such as depression, anxiety, and loneliness, with those aged 14 to 16 reporting more serious symptoms. One in six experience externalizing symptoms, such as hyperactivity, rule breaking, and aggression. One in 10 meet full diagnostic criteria for mental health issue. These are pretty serious stats. So, just giving context again, all right? The number of suicides in 2022 was almost 26% up from that reported in 2021. And suicide remained the leading cause of death for youth aged 10 to 29 for the fourth consecutive year in the row here. And about a third of all deaths in this age group were actually suicides. That's a startling and sobering statistic, okay? So mental health stigma looks like this. It is well-documented barrier to health-seeking behavior, engagement in care, adherence to treatment across a range of health conditions globally. Uh, I th we are investing a lot more. Things are moving in the right direction. Our colleagues at the Institute of Mental Health have done Excellent work over the last couple of years. We have a mental health blueprint, but mental health stigma is present around the world. It's not just unique to the Asian context. So why I bring this in? Allow youth above 14 to seek help without parental concern. Mental health treatment providers are asking for this, and I think, what if the parents are part of the problem and not really part of the solution? And and there is no law that says you can't consent to such treatment, okay? So 
I've gone through a little bit about these things, and now next I'm going to talk to you about, I suppose, what I use when I used to approach ethical issues. And I like to keep things simple, right? Because I deal with an age group where ethical issues come up a lot of the time, so I, I need it away. And I, I, I mean, nothing is more simple than the alphabet, right? So you are, we're always asking, analyzing facts, whether they're valid or complete. We always need more information, right? The use of balancing principles and such principles that you can think of when you're dealing with ethical issues as a whole would be the four pillars, four box tools. We've talked a little bit about zone of parental discretion, best interest and significant harm threshold. Comparing what the alternatives may be, what's the consequence of doing something or not doing something, and doing that and using that as a balancing point. Coming to a decision and then evaluating and reflecting upon that. Looks like a PDSE cycle, actually. So, just a reminder, doing good, do no harm, allowing someone to choose freely, ensuring fa fairness. It's the four pillars of medical ethics. Does one trump the other? In, uh, in ethic, ethical issues in pediatric, oftentimes I, th I feel the, the best interest yardstick is held up a lot. A lot more than actually autonomy, obviously. The four box tool of ethical analysis, I like using this one. I like using this one because it looks at it from a lot of places. It's, uh, it's, it's designed to systematically analyze and help with dilemmas in clinical medicine and can be used easily. It connects context to underlying ethical principles. Right? So medical indications, patient parental preferences, quality of life, and contextual features. The same ethical conundrum, or same, exact same case you bring to a clinical ethics committee, it seems exactly the same, right? Can have two completely different decisions. And it's based on this balance between these four. What about the best interest test and threshold? This considers the welfare of the child as the most important guiding principle in decision making on behalf of someone who can't make that decision. And the welfare of the child in the broadest sense is considered not from a medical perspective, but also from a psychological and social perspective. Then the significant harm threshold. So following that case of Charlie Gard, it was proposed that parents should have been allowed to make decisions on medical treatment for their children so long as their decision did not cause significant harm to their child. And this actually is in, consistent with the Children's Act, which allows actually for the removal of children from their parents by public authorities court order. In Singapore, we also can, like MSF child protection officers can actually remove a child from their home and place in a place of safety. But do note that when the court does that, or child protection, it does not terminate parental responsibility for making decisions or certain decisions for their child, okay? And this is the ethical underpinning in the principle of non-maleficence. So what happens when parents, adolescents, and doctors disagree? Which yardstick do you use? What do you want to use? How do you use it? Is it the best interest test, the significant harms test, the zone of parental discretion? And this again, uh, I've had discussions with a lot of my colleagues as well. Is this proportionality or balance, the balance to achieve what is there? You know, there are certain thresholds you know you cannot cross. And I always think about this, and one of uh, my esteemed colleagues says this often enough, and it always sticks in my mind. Kamu, you must remember who is going to take this patient home. Problem sits there, so he knows. He says that all the time. That's the one. Thank you. Who takes them home? What is that context? If you break that therapeutic alliance, what are you going to do? Are you going to take the patient home? So, shared decision making. So, this is my the stepwise model about it. And I do a lot of family conferences and a lot of family, in, together with the teen as well, right? 
because I think that is a process we need to be quite aware of. It's quite di different from a support decision making. A shared decision making process is much it's, it's different. There is a difference to it, right? You seek participation. Seeking participation doesn't mean you agree with everything. I mean, you know, you, you don't have to agree. Help your patient explore and compare treatment options. Assess your patient's values and preferences. Reach a decision and evaluate the decision. So it is one of those things. So you walk hand in hand with them, as opposed to you know, dragging them forward or them dragging you forward, right? So, and I, I look at that zone of parental discretion as uh, the ethical space and latitude for the parents to make that decision. Uh, as healthcare professionals, we're always pressed for time. We feel we don't have that space to make decisions, but you have to allow that space. You have to think, is it, it may not be a decision you agree with. We're always very good at the extremes. It's never gonna work. It's always gonna work. But sometimes good enough is good enough. And we have to sit with our own value system about whether what we think is good enough, right? So communication is key, and interactive skills are very, very important. Informed consent process affords an opportunity to establish a personal relationship with the patient and to review the treatment plan, reveal reasonable expectations, instill confidence, project hope, and assure that complications, if they occur, will be treated in a compassionate and expeditious manner. Uh, and I think that's what we always aim for with our, with our patient, patients, whoever they may be, okay? So evidence and ethics do go hand in hand. Parental authority, autonomy is not an absolute right. In the situation of minors and the vulnerable, Informed consent is actually tripartite, especially when you have a teen involved that can think. Communication is key, and shared decision-making process is a process that can strengthen the therapeutic relationship. So I'll end off here for one of the great philosophers. So like I said, things have not changed over hundreds of years. Our youth love luxury. They have bad manners and contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders and love idle chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants and not servants of their household. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up their food and tyrannize their teachers. Things really have not changed. <laughs> so, and this Socrates, and this is 450 BC. And one of the other things Socrates said that I love, I also like to quote to my residents is that I cannot teach you anything to learn, but hopefully when I teach you think. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>